We'll be in John chapter 5 this morning. If you want to go ahead and find that in your Bibles. John chapter 5. And in my hand, I have a little can that's become the best friend for many of us. Hopefully you recognize what it is. Uh, I was going to show you a commercial, but I'm pretty sure there's some copyright laws that I'll break if I did that. Um, so I just brought the can up. So a can of a breeze, right? Uh, an air freshener. I love what they said. This is eliminates tough, lingering odors. Uh, I know none of you have any tough, lingering odors in your house or around you or in your car. But uh, Febreze did a, a series of commercials a while back uh, where they talked about being nose blind. And I don't know if you saw these commercials or know anything about them, but uh, they would take common scenarios like a teenage boy in his room and his mom walks in and essentially tells him that his room smells like a gym sock, right? Not the best smell, right? But the boy didn't notice it. He's there playing his game. He's become nose blind. He's been in the room for so long that he didn't notice the smell. Or uh, one for you pet lovers. Uh, they show somebody driving to their vehicle with their, their bulldog was in the front seat. And uh, they thought that everything smelled great, but they said everyone else, when they see your car, and they turn the car into this big old shaggy dog. You know, everybody else smells the dog. You know, same thing for a cat. And they have several of those commercials. And as, as kind of funny as the commercials are, there's actually some science behind that. There actually is a thing about being nose blind that scientists talk about. So what happens is when you smell something, your brain then decides how to react to that smell. And if it's not a smell that, that threatens the brain or that needs some immediate reaction, the brain actually stops focusing on the smell. It's one of the reasons why when you walk into somewhere that smells good or that smells bad, and five minutes later you don't recognize the smell anymore, you've gotten used to it, it's because your brain is now focused on other things. The smell isn't a threat to the, to the brain. So the brain says, I'm turning a blind eye to that smell. I'm making you nose blind to it, in other words, and focusing on other things. Um, many of us have experienced this. This morning when I let our dogs back in the house, it was a little wet. I smelled wet dogs when the dogs came to the house. Five minutes later, I didn't smell wet dogs anymore. It's not because I gave the dogs a bath or because they aired out. The dogs still stunk. I just got used to it, right? It didn't bother me anymore because my nose got used to it. At one point in life, I delivered pizzas. And for the first week I delivered pizzas, every time I got in my car the next day, I could smell pizza, which would be really good, except the next day smell of pizza is not so good. It's a pretty nasty smell, actually. But after about a week of delivering pizzas, I got in my car and I no longer noticed that it smelled like pizza. And then two or three months after I stopped delivering pizzas, Kenny gets in the car and she's like, your car smells like pizza. Uh, and I didn't realize it still smelled like pizza, right? But it did, right? I was nose blind to it. And nose blindness is, is something that we've all, I think, experienced at one point or another. But there's another blindness that's like nose blindness. Then when it first happens, we may take notice of it. But then over time, it kind of loses its effect. And we begin to turn kind of a blind eye to it. And it's legalism. It's legalism. Today, as we continue into our study of the book of John, I want us to talk about being uh, legally blind or legalistically blind, maybe a better term there. And last week we looked at the story of Jesus healing the, uh, the paralytic there at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, and uh, we kind of stopped in the middle of the story. So I want us to pick up in, in the last part of this story in John chapter 5. And we're going to pick up with the last verse we read uh, last time, which is uh, verse 9 of John chapter 5. And I want to ask you this morning if you'll stand with me, please, in the honor of the reading of God's Word, if you have the ability. And we're going to pick up with the second half of verse 9, uh, because it's really kind of a, a whole separate section starts there. Uh, the second part of verse 9 says, uh, And that day was the Sabbath. Uh, really important, if this was a movie or a TV show, right there, ominous music would play and be kind of dun dun dun. Because all this story about the paralytic was leading up to John being able to tell us what Jesus did on the Sabbath. We're going to talk more about it in just a minute. Look at verse 10. It says, The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered to them, uh, He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed, who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. 
For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also that God, but also said, excuse me, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Thank you. Maybe seated. So, excuse me, if you remember, uh, last week we talked about this man. He's been at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, hanging out, waiting for the water to be stirred, hoping he can be the first one down to be healed. Jesus seeks him out, offers him this healing. He gets up and he walks. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 9. Um, in verse 9, we, we find out that he walks in front of these um, Jews. And when we talk about Jews here, um, that's really more a reference to the religious leaders of the day. Uh, so, so I'm probably going to refer to them as the Pharisees. That's more than likely what we're talking about, the group of people who were really ultra concerned with the keeping of the law at this point. And the Pharisees call him out for carrying his mat. And it's really interesting. I don't think that any part of Scripture is there by fluke. Um, there's no coincidences in Scripture. Every word is there because that's what God wanted us to have. And John very clearly points out at the end of verse 9 that Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath. He didn't do it on Monday or Tuesday or any other week, on the Sabbath. And the reason why this is so important is because John is about to show us Jesus confronting these religious leaders <coughs> with their own legalism, right? Uh, Jesus could have healed this man any other day. He could have picked any other day of the week. The man's been there, there at the pool waiting to get healed. He could have picked any other time. But Jesus deliberately picked the Sabbath in order to have this confrontation, right? I mean, he knew that the, the Pharisees of these Jews, these religious leaders, would, uh, would see this man carrying the mat. He knew the law. It wasn't that he was ignorant to the rabbinic law at the time uh, about not being able to do that. He knew they would see it. He knew they would say something about it. And it would provide him an opportunity to point out uh, their, their legalistic blindness to what was really happening, the work of God around them. These folks had really the, the look of a spiritual life, right? From the outside, the, these folks that are confronting this man looked like they were doing everything right. They were checking off all the boxes as far as people could tell. You know, they had this deep spiritual life, but in all reality, what they really had was an illusion of a deep spiritual life. They were doing all the external works, but the internal work was missing. And it's something that Jesus would expose the Pharisees for time and time again throughout the Gospels, was their lack of internal change. They were, they were really experts at taking God's commands and replacing them with their own man-made rules, their own man-made traditions. In, in Matthew 15, Jesus said this way. He said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, the reason why we know this isn't something new or with the time of Jesus was that that's actually a quote from the prophet Isaiah. So centuries earlier, God was already saying that people were replacing what he really said and what he really wanted with just this external keeping of rules and tradition, replacing it with man's way of doing things instead of God's way of doing things. And the Sabbath, in particular, had become a focus in Jewish life. It had become kind of the center point of all the law. Uh, a large part of the mission, the mission was uh, a collection, the first collection of, of, of the writing of the rabbis. Uh, the first time where they went through and they explained and listed out uh, all the different laws and commandments that the Jews were supposed to keep. And I noticed I didn't say all the ones that the Bible said. I said all the ones that the rabbis said. Uh, a very different list when you begin to look at the two of them. But inside the mission, there's a very large section that's dedicated just to Sabbath law. Um, when we look at the scripture, Sabbath law, we're really looking at the book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus 31, there's, there's about three verses there. Exodus 35, there's a verse there. And then scattered kind of here and there throughout scripture, there's references to Sabbath law. Essentially, the Sabbath law was designed to mirror what God did in Genesis chapter 1, right? Six days God created. He looked at the creation at the end of six days. This is very good. And then it says he rested. That doesn't mean God took a nap. He didn't rest like some of you going to rest after we leave this place after lunch today. Not that kind of rest. It means that he ceased doing the work that he was doing. His work at that time was the work of creation. He stopped doing the work of creation, and he stepped back and enjoyed the creation. He was able to, to step back and say, 
this is very good and just mask it, right? Now, if God would have stopped working completely at that time, everything would have fallen apart because he would have taken his providential hand off of everything. He would have stopped working. Life would have stopped being. The plants would have stopped rotating, doing all those orbiting and all that kind of good stuff, right? Everything, all creation would have been undone at that point. So God didn't stop working. He just ceased from the work he was doing. The Sabbath was created to mirror that so that at the end of six days, you stop doing your daily work the things that you did day in and day out, and you took a time back to enjoy the fellowship with God, to find rest in Him and peace and enjoy who God is. It wasn't that you didn't do anything. It was that you ceased from what you did day in and day out. That's why in the Ten Commandments, it doesn't say keep the Sabbath. It says keeping the Sabbath. That means the other six days, you do what you got to do, looking forward to the day when you get to stop and have that time of focusing on worshiping and finding joy and enjoyment and rest in God. And so... The, the Jews had, had taken that, that little bit of law that was there, combined with a few things from the prophets, and developed uh, this huge list of do's and don'ts. As a matter of fact, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, there are 39 forbidden categories of work that the Jews had come up with um, that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Uh, and one of those things uh, was the, the carrying of goods, which is what this man was doing by carrying a mat. He broke one of their laws. Um, some people believe so firmly in the, in the Sabbath law that they believe that if they perfectly kept the Sabbath law as a people, if every Jew would just keep all the Sabbath commandments, that God would send the Messiah that day in order to come and, and relieve them, come and, and to free them, right? So they're going to usher in the Messiah by perfectly keeping the law. So in other words, by being really good people, we'll get delivered. And the reason why that's so important is because there's a lot of people that come and sit in churches like this one every single week that think, if I can just be a really good person, then one day God is going to deliver me from hell. It has nothing to do with how good you are. Right? And we're about to see that. Jesus is about to call them out on it. It's not about being good and following the rules and the traditions. There's more to it than that. The rabbis have gotten to the point to where they would argue to the point of, of saying, if a chicken laid an egg on Sunday, was it lawful to eat it because the chicken had to work to lay the egg? <laughs> and it sounds kind of funny, but literally, they were having those kinds of debates. That's how legalistic they had gotten. And I want to tell you that it's really easy, I think, for us to fall into that category. And in the, in the two and a half years or so that I've been here, you've heard me talk about, a lot about uh, religious liberalism. Especially if you come on Wednesday night, we spent a long time uh, looking at liberalism creeping into the church and even into our own denomination at some points. And, and, and that's a, there's a danger there. But on the opposite end of that spectrum, there's a danger in becoming religiously legalistic also. There's a danger to this whole thing. It makes you blind. That's what I want us to focus on uh, for the time we've got left this morning, is to look at how legalism makes you blind. And the first thing I want you to see from this passage is that it makes you blind to people. Legalism makes you blind to people. I mean, here's this man who's been laying on this mat for 38 years, not able to walk, and Jesus comes along, he's healed, he's up, he's walking, and I want to tell you, my natural reaction to someone being healed who couldn't walk and can now walk would be one of celebration. I don't notice a lot of things. A lot of you can testify to the fact that I don't notice a whole lot of details. I'm a, I'm a forest and not the tree kind of a guy. But I think if someone hadn't been walking for 38 years and started walking, I would take notice of that, right? <laughs> And hopefully my reaction would be one of awe, one of wow, one of celebration, right? But look at what the Pharisees do. They start criticizing him. They don't celebrate what God's done. They don't have joy. They don't say congratulations. They don't do anything. They don't even send a card in the mail like, hey, I heard you're walking now. No, no, none of that kind of stuff, right? They criticize him. Why are you carrying your mat? Don't you know it's against the law to do that? That's the reaction to this man beginning to walk. They begin to criticize him for breaking the law. Jesus is speaking to the disciples in Matthew 23, and in verse 4, he described what it must have been like for, for this man at this point, right? Or how it must have felt. He says, they, blind, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. He says, look, the Pharisees are making life harder than it had to be. They're making up all of these rules. I tell people all the time, it's hard enough to read and understand scripture. It's hard enough to, 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 to remain uh, focused on the spiritual disciplines God's given us, much less making up a bunch of stuff that we got to keep, a bunch of rules. But that's what they were doing. Life in, in, at this time was so difficult for the average Jew that most of them had given up 
really trying to, to keep all the rules of, of the rabbis. It was just rule after rule after rule after rule. It was disheartening. And here comes a chance to celebrate. Here comes a chance to say, look at what God's done. But they were so focused on their own rules and their own legalism that they missed what's happened with the man. They are equating their legalistic or religious teachings to the actual law of God. That's a problem. When we start taking what we say and put it on the same level as what God says, then all of a sudden that puts us in the place of God. And the rabbis, as we will see as we go continue through the book of John over the next weeks and months to come, they do that time and time and time again. They put themselves in the place of God with their own legalistic teachings. I remember in one of the churches that had a privilege of pastoring that um, Easter was coming up and there was a big push in the Southern Baptist Convention that year, a program called Find It Here. Uh, some of you may remember those. As a matter of fact, I think there were still a few Find It Here New, New Testaments when I first got here floating around the church. But uh, we decided to do that around Easter at the church I was at. And we had a big push. Uh, we, we, were, we were literally in the middle of nowhere. There were more cows than people in the little community we were in. Uh, but I kept telling folks, that God, I really think if we do what God's telling us to do, we're going to see people come. And uh, I told them to prepare. People didn't believe us. We ended up having over 200-something people come to that church that Sunday for Easter, uh, which was twice as much as what would normally be there on Easter. And, um, and that was exciting, but the real exciting part happened at the end of the service. There was a young lady who had been coming. Her and her sisters had come on Wednesday night. They were like a lot of our Wednesday night kids. We went and picked them up on the van. Uh, you know, that we couldn't ever get her parents really engaged, but we got these sisters. We bring them on Wednesday nights, uh, feed them, uh, put them through class, and teach them, do those things. And every once in a while, she'd come on a Sunday. Well, she came this Sunday, and at the end of service, she walks down and says she wants to give her life to Christ. Exciting time for me. Exciting time for her. Should be an exciting time for the church. But here's this young lady that we've been investing all this time and energy in. We see uh, that it's paying off, that, that, that finally she's giving her life to Christ. So we go through everything that we go through at the end of the service. The service is over. Standing there. Almost everybody's out, and this, this little lady, I hate to call her old because her age doesn't matter so much, but this little lady comes up, and I say, isn't it exciting? She had taught this young girl at one point in Sunday school. And she's like, yeah, but, but do you think it's real? She was so caught up in looking at what she knew about this girl from the outside, that she was refusing to see her for real on the inside of the work that God was doing, right? Wouldn't even give her the benefit of the doubt. And boy, that should sound familiar because sometimes we're that way, aren't we? Sometimes we're really quick to jump on things and say, well, I don't see this, and you're not following this rule or this tradition, or you didn't do it my way. Therefore, if you didn't do it my way, you must not have done it for real, or you don't really mean this or that. And we miss who, who this person is and what God is doing in their life, all because we're blinded by our own rules and traditions, our own legalism. Legalism doesn't change a person on the inside. That's why it has to focus on this idea of manipulating people on the outside, right? It's about what you do and not so much about what has been done in you or what is inside your heart and your mind. It's one of the reasons why it's so much easier to focus on other people when we're legalistic. I've never seen someone who was, who was legalistic look at themselves in a mirror. It's always about what everyone else is doing, right? Because a legalistic person looks at themselves and says, I'm doing it right. You're not doing it my way, right? You're not doing it the way that I was brought up to bring it by. You're not going through my, my tradition, my religion, my things. Therefore, you're doing it wrong and I'm doing it right. right? You know, that's kind of the mindset. They can't see the person. All they see is how that person isn't doing it their way. And that's what the rabbis see, right? Here's this man walking who hasn't been walking for four centuries almost, and all they see is that he's breaking the law. He's breaking the law. I remember growing up, most of you know my story, that I didn't grow up in a Christian home, didn't get in church until my preteen years. And I remember the first time I walked into church with a hat on. Some of y'all know what happened. Uh, there was a man, I, don't even, I couldn't tell you this day what man did that, but I do know that hat ended up not on my head. Uh, I think he flicked it off, first of all. He either flicked it off or hit me in the back of the head. I don't remember which one it was. Many of y'all gotten that slap in the back of the head before. Um, and I got a big head, so it's easy to slap, you know. But uh, I lost the hat, right? And I learned through that, you don't wear a church, uh, hat in church, right? He was focused on the fact that I had a hat on. What he didn't focus on was telling me why we don't wear a hat in church. 
He didn't focus on the internal attitude of respect for God, which is in Western culture. is why we why men don't wear a hat in church. A lot of us want to go to Scripture. has nothing to do with Scripture. 100% nothing to do with Scripture. Uh, it's 100% about our culture. Our culture is disrespect to God uh, to wear a hat in church. So, and at one point, to wear a hat in any, any building was considered a sign of disrespect to women and all those kinds of things. But instead of addressing internals, we address the externals. And it doesn't take anything big. It takes little things like that to add up a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. And all of a sudden, our minds have changed from focusing on God and what he teaches and what he's telling us we need to be to focusing on all of these little externals that matter to us. We can't see what's happening and who people really are because we're so focused on all those little external things that add up. Corey hates going to Dairy Queen with me. In high school, I, I managed to do a queen, and, uh, and, and I'm pretty critical, uh, especially of ice cream. Like, like, if you cover up the drip holes, it just drives me absolutely crazy, right? If you don't get the curly cue right on the top, it drives me crazy, those kinds of things, right? I forget how good the ice cream tastes because I'm so busy focusing on all the little details that messed up, right? And some of us are that way with people day in and day out. We're so focused on what, what, what the little tiny nitpicky things that we forget they're people God created in his own image. We forget that God loves them has called us to love them. Because we get so caught up in all those things. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you notice what these Pharisees don't do, or what these Jews don't do in this passage? They never comment on the mercy and grace that God displayed to this man by Helium. Never once. And isn't that what the Sabbath was really all about? Was seeing God at work and being in awe of it and being thankful for it and celebrating what God has done? That was part of the whole point of the day, but they're missing it because of their rules. Their legalism made them miss him. Legalism not only makes you blind to, to people, it also makes you blind to the self. It makes you blind to yourself. See, legalism is, is self-righteousness. The reason why it's self-righteous is because it's based on our own system of, of right and wrong, our own work of our own creation is done what God's created, what God has given us. These Pharisees, they refused to see their own lack of submission to God and to his authority. They were blinded to themselves because their focus was really on their rules and not on God's. Now, if you were to ask, every one of these folks that were, they were calling this man out would have said they were good people, Right? They would have gone beyond that. I think they would have even said that they were godly people. They might have even looked at other folks and said, you know what, I'm more godly than all these other people. I'm closer to God than all these other people because I keep X, Y, and Z. Jesus gives us a great example of that, right? He talks about the prayer of the Pharisee and the public. And he says the Pharisee stands up and he's praying and saying, thank you, God, that I'm not like all these other people because I keep all the rules and I tithe more than I have to and I do this and I do that. And the publican says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? And Jesus says, the publican's the one that God's looking for. He's looking for that attitude, for that heart, for that kind of relationship, not the one that says, I've kept all the rules and look at how good I am. And sometimes we're much more like that Pharisee than the publican. Their focus is on, on their rules and not God's. You know, the, the love of rules and the love of tradition, I think it easily creeps into our lives. It does it very subtly, and eventually it keeps us from seeing through the eyes of God. And if right now you're sitting here thinking, yeah, y'all people need to hear this, then that means I'm talking to you, right? Um, because that's what it is. Legalism makes us look at everybody else, right? And if you don't believe that, that you like your rules and traditions, come next week and let me change up the order of service. Come next week and let me sing a new song we ain't ever sung before. <coughs> let, me, let me use a different version of the Bible. Some of you have, come, have noted that I don't mind changing a few things. But what you don't know is that I hate change. Just like the rest of you, I really do. I am such a person of order. I get up every morning at pretty much the same time. I do everything in the same order. I eat the same breakfast almost every single morning. This morning when I got up, I went to the cabinet, and I, I went through every glass that we had in the, in, the, in the house to go to the back of the cupboard to get my Sunday glass. I have one glass that I drink out of on Sunday. It's the only glass I drink out of. I am that way about traditions and rules, those things. That's how I am, yeah. But then when it comes to the way of God, I can't put those things in place of what God has said. I can't put those places in the, in, in those things in, in the way to where I don't see God or see myself or see others. 
These folks would have claimed to love this man. If you would have asked these Jews, do you love that, that paralyzed man before he was healed? Yep. After he was healed, do you love him? Yep. But now they're not going to have anything to do with him because he's not keeping the law they, the way they think they should. Because he's carrying a mat. Right? They're unable to see their own hypocrisy of saying that the Sabbath is about focusing on God, but they're, they're missing the focus because they're focusing on the rules. They're missing what God is doing right in front of them. It's hypocrisy in work. <clears throat> they would have said that they're dedicated to God and to his ways, but they end up persecuting God in the flesh here, right? It says that because Jesus did this on the Sabbath, they wanted to kill him. I love God, but, but you're not keeping my rules, so I'm going to kill you is what they said to God in the flesh. Matthew 7, Jesus says, Judge not, judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, legalism moves you beyond evaluation and analysis. As believers, we're called for evaluation and analysis. That's the sign of judgment we're called to. We're not called to the sign of vengeance. That's God's. That belongs to God, right? What it does instead, then, is it puts us in this place where we focus so much on, on other specs and other flaws and other sins and other failures uh, that we can't separate that from who they are. And what it causes us to do is to, to turn a blind eye to our own. We don't see those same flaws and failures in ourselves. He said we have planks in our eyes compared to some of the speck in their eyes. When we're blinded by legalism. Notice what he also says. He doesn't say leave either one of them in the eye. This is that spot where the world comes to you and says, the Bible says don't judge. The Bible doesn't say don't judge. It says judge not unless you'll be judged by the same measure. So he says, take care of your own sin, take care of the own plank in your own eye, take care of those own things, and then, notice what he says at the end there, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Then you can help someone else. It's not sitting in the spot of, of judgment, it's the spot of help is what it really is. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be able to look at them, evaluate, look at it, analyze the situation, and say, here's what needs to happen. Let's do this thing. It's still a cause to action. But legalism stops us from it. Legalism keeps us from being able to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Because we sit in the seat of God when we're legalistic. Legalism not only makes us blind to others and to ourselves, but it also makes us blind to God. And I think this is so apparent in this passage, right? Jesus' actions here on the Sabbath uh, would have been seen as just completely opposed to the teachings of the rabbi. They would have looked at him and said that, that he was uh, an antinomian person, that, that he was someone who was against the law. They would have called him this, this, this liberal hippie kind of a guy, right? You're not keeping our laws. You hate us. You hate the Jews. You hate God. Right? That's what they would have said. But it's all because Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath isn't designed to be a path to God's approval. Keeping the rules, keeping tradition, keeping the law was never designed for us to look at God and God give us favor. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us the only person who ever kept all the rules God gave us, all the commandments, was Jesus. And it said that the rules were not given to us so that we could earn favor with God. It says that the rules were given to us so that we could see that we fail. To see that we're sinners. And that by seeing that we're sinners, see that we need the grace and mercy of God in our lives. If it wasn't for the law, we would never know we were lost. We would never know we had failed and fallen short. Right? That's what it's designed to do. The Sabbath is part of that. The Sabbath was designed as a gift to us. Mark 2.27, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath, in other words, was created to honor God and to benefit his people, not to manipulate God into giving us approval. And some of us are really bad about this idea. We think if we just do X, Y, and Z and go through all these things, that God's going to look at us and say, I love you a lot more because you did these things. Even once we put our faith in Christ, a lot of times we're stri striving day in and day out to win God's approval. There's a reason why it's called grace. Unmerited favor. You can't do anything to earn God's favor or approval. The best thing you do is still nothing to him. Right? 
It's unmerited favor. You can't earn it in any kind of way. Jesus has already done all the favor that you need. When he died on the cross, he got God's favor for you without you doing anything. All right? That's what the cross did. You can keep all the rules after that. And it makes you a really good person in people's eyes. It makes you a really good church member or a really good community member, a citizen, all those kinds of things. But it doesn't earn you any more favor with God than Christ has already done on the cross for you. Their focus is on rules and traditions. And eventually, look at what it does. It leads to the persecution of Jesus. And that persecution grows to the point to where uh, they convince people in chapter 19, we'll get to this down the road, to start screaming, crucify him. They didn't yell crucify him because Jesus was going around doing bad things. They yelled crucify him because he wasn't doing things the way they thought he should be doing them. Some of us do that to people every day, day in and day out. We watch the news, we read the newspaper, we get online, we do whatever, we go out in the community, and we're like, God used to send those people to hell. Look at what they're doing, right? Time and time again we do those things. We look down our nose at people because they're not doing things the way that we say they should be doing. Here it tells us, in verse 18 we get to the point to where, to where Jesus has said, you know what, my father's been working in the now and I've been working. It says the Jews add to him not keeping the law uh, that, that, that they're looking for other things and now he's saying he's God, right? We hate him even more because he's not agreeing with what we say and with what we do. They're saying, kill the God that they're walking around saying they love so much that they've made these rules for. God, we're doing this for you. Right? That's what all these rules are about. God, we're doing this for you. We want to keep you, your name holy and keep you separated and make you known to all the people. So we're making up all this stuff. All these hoops that people have to jump through. Jesus says there in verse 17, really, he knew what was going on in their minds, so he answers them. They didn't say anything to him directly, they were told, but it says that he answered, right? My father has been working until now, and I have been working. So, so Jesus here is saying, if it's okay for God the Father to work, then it's okay for me to work. In other words, he's saying, would you say that God's not working today? And none of the Jews would say that God's not working because of the hand of providence. They know if God's not working, everything ceased to exist, right? So they would agree God was working in somehow or another on that. Uh, and so Jesus is saying, look, uh, since God's working, I'm working. And they understood it. John tells us in verse 18, they understood that Jesus was saying he is God in the flesh, right? That he has equated himself with God. In Mark 2, 28, it just says, therefore the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. He's like, look, I have the right to do this. Here's something that happens. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Genesis chapter 1, six days of creation. God rests on the seventh day, which is another reason why we're not talking about periods of time. One day equal thousands and thousands of years of creation. Because God hadn't been resting for thousands and thousands of years once he got done creating. He rested for a day. No one ever said God rested for thousands of years. We want to make creation about thousands of years. But that's a whole other thing. That's a freebie. We can talk about that one tonight. Um, but after creation, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Man sins, right? And ever since then, every day of the week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap year, uh, however you want to look at that, God has been working to restore man. The Sabbath law itself was given as an attempt for man to be able to see his need for restoration to God, right? God had to stop working. He still continued working. And Jesus is calling out on that. God's working, therefore I can work. And he makes this, this unmistakable revelation of these religious leaders uh, claiming to be equal to God and, and claiming really full, complete deity right here. We can never say that Jesus never claimed to be God in the Scripture. We're in the fifth chapter of John. This is, what, the third time, I think, where we've seen a direct statement from, from Jesus saying, I am God in the flesh, really. And what happens here, instead of them going, whoa, we didn't see it, and changing their minds and their hearts and all those things, their legalism blinds them. Blinds them to God being right in front of them to the point to where they hate him even more. Not just for breaking the law, but now for saying that he's God. I mean, they're looking at Jesus and saying, this carpenter's son, can you just hear, this carpenter's son says he's God, right? Can you not just hear the disdain and, and the way they think and the way that they act? 
And boy, if you ever stop and just listen to some church folks, you can hear the same thing. For them Democrats. Those Republicans. Those Libertarians. I'm just using that because we're in November. You know, <laughs> those turkey-loving folks. Those ham-loving folks. Whatever the case is. Replace it with whatever it is. But when you start to listen, church folks can be just as disdainful toward folks as everybody else. Sometimes we're even worse. Jesus didn't fit their expectations. He didn't fit their religion. Uh, he didn't fit their laws. He didn't fit their traditions. So in their mind, there was no way that he could be the son of God, right? He doesn't fit what we think, therefore he isn't. They thought this man who just, just paralyzed this, this man, you know, they didn't think that, that he could be the Messiah. It wasn't even really on their radar. Their legalism caused them to miss God at work. In the life of the, of, of the paralytic man, in their own life, they had a chance to be able to see a miracle and rejoice over it. They missed it with God with Jesus <clears throat> being there right in front of them. It blinds them to the point that in chapter 7, they call Jesus demon-possessed. They would call him in chapter 8 a Samaritan who was demon-possessed. Uh, and, uh, and they would also say that he was born out of fornication. In chapter 10, they called him insane. In Matthew chapter 12, they claimed that his power was satanic. See, the legalism of the Pharisees would cause them to team up with people that they never thought they would team up with. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other. One was legalistic and one was liberal. It's like the Republicans and the Democrats coming together to go after the Libertarians, if you want to look at it that way. They hated each other. But the Pharisees, before this is all over with, would team up with the Sadducees. They would team up with the Romans who were oppressing them, who had been praying for God to come and, and destroy the Romans, and so they can come up and be the people God called them to be. They team up with both of them in the end to crucify this Christ because he broke their rules and traditions. That's how far they were blinded, how much they couldn't see him because of their own self-righteousness. See, what happens for us is we have this desire to live autonomously, right? This desire to live with us making our own decisions about how things go and not be connected or tied down to anybody or to anything. Inside the Southern Baptist Church, we celebrate autonomy, right? There is nobody anywhere outside of Christy Baptist Church that's telling Christy Baptist Church what to do. We don't have a bishop or a pope or anybody else, no, no uh, regional or area leaders that tell us what to do. We make our own decisions, right? We, we celebrate that. But a lot of times we celebrate that in our own lives so much that we say God doesn't even get to make those decisions. Whether we say it intentionally or we just do it that way. We just live that way. We do things in a way that makes sense to us and say, you know what, God, your way doesn't make sense, but this does because this worked for me in the past. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep following my rules, keep following my traditions. I'm going to keep following my preconceived notions of who God is. And what we're actually doing is we're creating a God of our own making at that point, which is an idol. Just like the religious leaders, we have to make a choice. Right? Do we choose Jesus or do we choose our own way? Which one do you choose? Are you choosing it the way that God has given us, or are you choosing the way that you're creating yourself? <coughs> I think too often we elevate our own, our own wills, our own rules, our own traditions, our own version of what Christianity should look like, or what God has said. I think there's this, this war that wages on in all of us. Right? Scripture talks about the fleshly man versus the spiritual man, or the fleshly man versus the new man. We all have that war, right? Part of me constantly wants to go back to this place where I can do it on my own. I can follow the rules and keep these things. It's easy for me to do that. But it's really hard for me to do it the way God's given. To put my faith in Christ who I haven't seen. To know that one day he says he's going to deliver me and let me into heaven that I haven't ever seen or been a part of or had witnesses come back and tell me that it was true. Right? It's difficult for us. And it shows up in our legalism of, I'd rather just do it on my own. Some of us are even trying to run parallel paths. God, I love you. I'm going to do things your way. But, but in all reality, I'm going to keep myself over here and keep these rules and traditions that I've got over here. Because, well, just in case this doesn't work out, I've got this backup plan, right? There's no backup plan into heaven. <coughs> Some of us are so connected to our own ways of doing things in legalism that this week we've missed God. 
And my challenge to you today is don't let it keep going. The Pharisees, as far as we can tell, the majority of them never make the change. They never get past their own legalism to be able to see Jesus. But there's a few specks here and there. There's Nicodemus, who we've already studied about, who kind of breaks tradition and comes to Jesus, and Jesus tells him he must be born again. Jesus points to really the relationship aspect and not the rule aspect. My challenge for us then is to examine ourselves. Do what we would tell the Pharisees. The Pharisees were standing here, all of us would say, y'all need to check yourself. Right? Y'all need to examine yourself. Are you really following what God said to do or are you just doing it the way you want to do it? Right? We would all say to the Pharisees, but I'm saying say it to yourself today. Are you doing things the way God's told you to do it? Are you doing it the way that you're making up? Because if it's the latter, that makes you legalistic. When it's all about the rules and about tradition. If you find yourself in that spot, today's a great day to stop. Today's a great day to go to God and say, you know what, God, I, I know this is wrong, and I want to start doing this the way that you said do it. It starts off with that relationship aspect of putting your faith in Christ by grace through faith that you're saved, not of works, as the scripture says. That's where it starts. If today you haven't done that, if you haven't put your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to your time of invitation to come down and let's take care of that today. Mm -hmm. Many of you in here have done that, but I also know that, that many of us in here struggle with getting toward legalism. It's a struggle in our lives. So maybe today you should come and have some time to pray. For other churches, it's welcome for you to come and, and spend some time praying mm -hmm. and asking God to put you on the path that you're supposed to do. To make your life about him, not about all the rules of religion and tradition. Or maybe there's something else going on in your life that God's been talking to you about and you need to do some business with him this morning. I want to invite you after we pray to, to do that business. Take care of what it is, or whatever it is God's calling you to do. Father, I thank you that you didn't just stop at telling us the story of, of the paralytic man, but you showed us the interaction afterward. But you help us to see the, the, the legalism of, of these Jews, of these religious leaders, of these people who the world will look at and say they're very godly people. And in doing so, Father, you're showing us a mirror of what we look like sometimes. And it's my prayer that over the next few minutes, we would deal with that. That we would truly look at ourselves, we would look at our hearts, we would look at the things that we say, the things that we do. We would examine our relationship with you and we would try, try to determine, Father, uh, what we look like through your eyes. And if we don't like what, what you're seeing in us, we would do something to change today. We would come to you and give it over to you. Whether we come to you for salvation, come to you for a time of just renewal or rededication, come to you just asking for you to make known in our life those things that are legalistic, those things that are replacing you in our lives and your way. Well, I pray that you give us boldness, you give us courage to, to be honest with ourselves and to, to do whatever it is you've called us to do today. For all this in Jesus' name.